Hello, and welcome to today's webcast Q&A about psoriasis. My name is Bev Bromfield, and I'll be your moderator for today's presentation. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop in the upper right corner. You've joined this presentation using your computer speaker system by default. This means if you hear music through your computer, you should be able to hear the presentation. If you prefer to join over the telephone, select use telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Although we are highlighting questions received in advance of today's webinar, you'll have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenter by typing into the questions pane on the control panel. We'll collect these and address as many as possible during Dr. East's Q&A today. Before I provide information about the foundation, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our sponsors, AbbVie, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Janssen, Novartis, CeraVe, and Neutrogena for their support of today's webinar. Since many of you may be new to the foundation, here's a little background about who we are, our mission, and what we do. In 2019, the National Psoriasis Foundation launched a new strategic plan which guides everything we do as an organization. To achieve our mission, the following goals were identified. Lead collaborative and transformational research in psoriatic disease. Improve health outcomes by increasing the lifespan and health of individuals living with psoriatic disease. Secure resources necessary to achieve our mission-related goals. By attending today's program, you've already taken a step towards expanding your knowledge about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, moving towards a better understanding of what it means to live with psoriatic disease. If you have psoriatic disease, you can help accelerate our efforts towards collaborative and transformational research that leads to a greater understanding of the disease and a cure by participating in the NPF Corona National Psoriasis Patient Registry, which is the largest independent observational registry of psoriasis patients in the U.S. This registry represents a network of dermatology clinics that collect and study patient health information allowing researchers to compare the safety and efficacy of psoriasis treatments, better understand conditions that are related to psoriasis, and explore the history of the disease. You can share your experience with researchers about what it means to live with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis by participating in Citizen Scientists. Answer questions and view your data along with over 5,000 participants. Data is used to help researchers gain a better understanding of the disease. To learn more and participate, visit the websites listed on the screen. We continue to improve the health of individuals living with psoriatic disease through our Patient Navigation Center, the world's first personalized support center for people impacted by psoriatic disease. The Foundation's Patient Navigation Center is available to help you find physicians, treatment information, navigate insurance issues, access support through our one-to-one -one program, and more. Contact us at 800-723-9166 or visit psoriasis.org slash navigation center. To help the Foundation achieve its goals, as mentioned, please support our mission through donations or by participating in local team NPF events near you. You can learn more at psoriasis.org slash donate or teamnpf.org. On behalf of the National Psoriasis Foundation, thank you for attending today's webinar and for submitting questions in advance. This webinar is truly for you, since your questions form the basis of what Dr. East will discuss today. Today's questions will be broken out by categories, which Dr. East will mention shortly. If submitting questions today, please type your questions based on the announced topic. We'll try to address as many questions as possible in the time allowed. Now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Benjamin East. Dr. East is a dermatologist with Baker Allergy, Asthma, and Dermatology in Portland, Oregon, where he specializes in treating a variety of skin diseases, including psoriasis, using the latest technology and treatment options. Dr. East also holds a doctorate in immunology and microbiology. Additionally, Dr. East is a clinical investigator with the Oregon Medical Research Center, where clinical trials focus on current and emerging treatments for psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, hair loss, and other diseases of the skin, nails, or hair. Dr. East is also a clinical associate professor with the Department of Dermatology at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. Dr. East began his work in clinical research while at OHSU, acting as lead investigator in many studies on treatments for skin diseases, such as psoriasis. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. East, 
will provide as many answers to your questions about psoriasis symptoms, management, and treatment. Please welcome Dr. East. Thank you, Bev. And thank you to everybody who's listening and who submitted questions. As Bev mentioned, I like to think I know a little bit about psoriasis. Hopefully I'll be able to answer your question. I've been, I've been involved over a decade now with different clinical trials of many of the, the products that are on the market, including the biologic medications for psoriasis. I ran a specialty clinic at Oregon Health and Science University with my partner, Andy Blauvelt, we were dedicated to looking at patients that had uh, severe psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So I'm very excited to be able to, to, uh, to talk to you today and, and hopefully address all, if not close to all these questions. We had, we had quite a few. Um, these are my disclosures. So I, again, I, I do investigate many of the medications. I work as a consultant for many pharmaceutical companies, and I, I um, speak on some of these medications as well, and those are listed here. All right. So we took the many questions and grouped them into a few areas, which seem to have a lot of common questions. So we're going to go over these in order. Uh, the first, uh, many questions about what triggers psoriasis um, and what do you do when you're in a flare. There are questions on types of psoriasis, including uh, what's now recognized as harder to treat areas uh, like the scalp. We'll go over treatment options. So again, many questions around some of the newer treatments and what's what's available now and what's coming up on the horizon. I can say it's 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 an exciting time among the providers like myself who are treating uh, patients with psoriasis. We have a lot more to offer you all who suffer from psoriasis. Obviously, this is a unique situation in the last six months with the um, pandemic, and there's been a lot of questions around the world, I know, about how does COVID-19 affect psoriasis, and are we safe treatment options for psoriasis if someone is at risk or actually becomes infected with COVID-19. And then there's a, there's a final section with some questions about what is upcoming, what are the latest research trends. So without further ado, First, the section is triggers and flare management. So Dr. East, psoriasis seems to worsen with age and stress. Why is that? So fabulous question. And there's a lot of theory out there about why we think uh, psoriasis uh, manifests at a certain time in someone's life or, or gets worse with certain issues. The, the answer, of course, is complex and there's still a lot that needs to be understood. In general, psoriasis is an immune-mediated condition. And so in uh, individuals who are genetically predisposed, meaning they have a variety of different genes that turn on this, this um, inflammation throughout the body. The inflammation ends up causing the skin to grow too quickly and to not shed properly, which gives you the, the plaques of psoriasis. And it can get into the joints and cause the destructive changes in the joints and psoriatic arthritis, and it can influence the cardiovascular system and lead to, to more uh, cardiovascular disease. Because it's immune mediated, the assumption is that immune activity leads to bouts of psoriasis. So stress, I'll take the stress part first. So stress is invoked for a lot of disease, and that's probably because a stressful situation involves activating immune activity throughout the body. And so um, as a natural consequence of that, if you're already predisposed uh, you know, to, to have a downstream effect of that stressful event. If it turns out that that downstream event is your psoriasis, well, stress can seem to bring it out. The question about age is interesting. If you look at studies of patients that have psoriasis, there's usually reported to be two peaks um, in terms of when people break out. So there's a peak usually reported in patients' 20s and 30s when they break out with psoriasis. And then in, in their 50s, 60s, there's a second peak. And the two distinct peaks may be different in individuals uh, based on their genetics. And so, for instance, many of the, the genes that seem to go along with patients um, who have psoriasis in their 20s and 30s are different than the patients that break out later in life. As you're a younger individual with psoriasis, the amount of psoriasis and the severity, it's not uncommon for it to get worse as you get older. And I think of that because there's a feed forward mechanism uh, going on. When you're stressed and the psoriasis is breaking out, the, um, the changes that occur in the skin lead to feedback on the immune system, which causes that, that immune system to continue to, to be inflamed. And so you get this cycle. So I tend to think that it worsens with time because there's, there's this continued immune pathway that feeds back and kind of promotes more inflammation and more, more disease change. On the other hand, at the extreme of life, so Patients that are up in years, you can actually find psoriasis improve. 
you know, when you're perhaps in your 70s and 80s, you can see psoriasis improve and sometimes go away. And that may be due to the fact that with aging, some of the years of accumulated immunity um, begin to wane a bit as we get older, which again is potentially why, you know, uh, we get sicker as, as elderly individuals too. But sometimes as you, as you age, uh, the psoriasis can actually improve. Next question, uh, every time I get a flu vaccine, I notice my psoriasis lesions get worse. Can you explain why this may be occurring? That's another great question. So it certainly doesn't happen in all individuals with psoriasis, but it's not uncommon that patients will report having a vaccination. And it's not necessarily a flu vaccine, it can be any vaccine. And as they, they get the vaccine a few days later or so, they, they become worse in terms of their psoriasis. And again, the presumed mechanism is that the vaccination is triggering an immune response. So you're hoping to, be, to invoke an immune response against what you're vaccinated for. Uh, for instance, you're getting a flu vaccine to hopefully prevent the flu. And so that killed form of flu virus is activating an immune response to protect you should you come across the real flu virus. And so again, that, um, that pathway triggers inflammation. And if you're prone to psoriasis, again, you can break out or get worse. Flu itself is interesting and similar to the flu vaccine. If you get the flu or other viruses, one of the proteins your body makes is called interferon. And it's been known for quite a long time that interferons, which are, you know, they're, they're supposed to promote inflammation to help fight off something like a virus. Those interferons in individuals prone to psoriasis can drive production of psoriasis or even trigger the occurrence of psoriasis. So the, the vaccination is one of the examples where it may be a trigger or the, the early stages of inflammation that, that begin to, to set up the psoriasis. A lot of triggers actually can, can be related to infections in the body or trauma to the skin. And those are, they're, again, they're insults to the body that, that invoke inflammation for a protective effect. But again, when you're prone to psoriasis, that may, it may end up triggering the psoriasis as a consequence. Interesting. And what is the best way to keep the horrible itching under control? Ah, uh, that's that's another good question. I guess the first thing I, I would I would hope to acknowledge is that itching is a horrible part of many patients with psoriasis phenomenon. Not everybody with psoriasis itches. In fact, there there are some studies saying about half of patients who have psoriasis actually don't itch much at all, and the other half of patients have horrible itching. And I would encourage you when you're talking with a, a dermatologist or another provider, if this is a big issue for you, to bring it up because I think you know when I trained. 15 years ago or so now, there was more emphasis on itching in patients that have eczema, a different skin condition. And if, if someone came in, they were itching, you were taught, well, it's probably not psoriasis because psoriasis shouldn't itch. And that really is just not the case. So yes, itching is a, is a horrible issue. In general, the itching is a, it's just a manifestation of the psoriasis. So if you have itching areas, the best way to get it under control is to get treatment for the psoriasis. So again, that's going to depend on the individual, you know, what the best treatment approach is um, for you as an individual. There's nothing currently that directly addresses the itching in psoriasis as opposed to the, the, the overall psoriasis itself. So, you know, the most treatments that improve the psoriasis plaques are going to get the itching under control. I would say there's discussion about the role of itching in scalp psoriasis. Scalp psoriasis tends to be really itchy. And the hair follicle, since your head's covered in hair, um, it has a lot of innate tendency to be itchy. There's a lot of innervation on a cell type, like mast cells that produce uh, molecules that'll make you itch. And so there's some discussion about, do we be uh, looking at therapy that, that addresses the itching uh, separate from the inflammation, especially for scalp psoriasis too. Uh, currently, uh, my approach is to say, we gotta get the skin clear. And as your skin clears, your itching should get under control. And the last question for this section, uh, my mother had psoriasis from the time she was 40. It didn't hit me until 60. Why? That, you know, I think it goes back to the, you know, the question about when it starts and, and how it progresses over time. If you look at, so again, genetics of psoriasis indicate that there are multiple different genes involved. The hereditary nature of the disease is not straightforward. Um, such that this is not a, the, the type of illness where, you know, half of your children have, have a risk of getting psoriasis. We do know that if you have a sibling or you have a, um, a parent who has psoriasis, your risk of getting psoriasis is higher. If you have two parents who have psoriasis, risk of getting it probably doubled from what it was with one. So that risk is there. 
when it begins, though, is not understood well. And so I don't know of a great way to predict why someone would, would get their, you know, their mother uh, broke out in their 40s and, and they didn't get it until 60s. Again, like I said, there's a, there's a time period of, in there of middle age where a lot of patients will break out. So I think that 20-year time difference is, is not really not unheard of, uh, wouldn't be surprising at all. Um, but actually, you know, why it happens, um, you know, at a certain time in an individual, not, not understood very well. And again, probably goes back to different triggering events um, and something something excited it in, in your mother at the age of 40 and triggering didn't occur until you were 60. Moving on to our next section, types of psoriasis. So what is the latest, most effective treatment for palmer plantar psoriasis? Okay. So Palm, palm plantar psoriasis. There are different types of psoriasis, especially when they affect palms um, and the soles of the feet that palm, palm or plantar disease. So oftentimes patients that have plaques on the body um, or the scalp will also have it affect the bottom of the feet and the palms. And my general answer to uh, how to treat those patients is that the treatments that we use to affect the psoriasis of the body are usually effective on the palms and soles as well. The, the caveat is, if you look in the last five years, there have finally been studies, clinical trials done, looking at the effect of different agents on palm and palm and sole psoriasis. Um, so there's now fairly good data in those patients so that they do respond similarly to the body. I think the general trend when I look at all that data is that the palm and soles can be slower to respond than the body. And there is a lower percentage of patients where the, the palm and soles will really clear up. So there's it's still a harder treatment area. There are other patients that, that have basically just palm and sole psoriasis. And they usually break down in, into two categories. The more classic type have, have thick scaly changes to the skin on the palms and soles. And the other type have pustules, so that palm and sole pustular psoriasis is a different variety. The classic type, where it's fissured skin, again, it is harder to treat area. And in patients that predominantly have it in the palms and soles, there isn't a lot of well of well done clinical trial data to show what the most effective treatment is. Unfortunately, um, the good news is with you know the efforts of, of the MPF and providers and patients you know around the world, pharmaceutical companies are starting to actually ask that question and, and say we should probably be figuring that out. So again, if you look at some of the the most recent biologic medications, some of the combination topical products. Uh, some of the oral medications like a pramil acid or received improvement, there's that, there are studies showing um, that they can be effective. I don't have a great answer, though, because, again, in my experience, it can be a, a much harder area to treat. And unfortunately, it still involves some trial and error, I think, in finding the, the correct medication. Pustular psoriasis on the palms and soles is another another category entirely. And there's there's very little good trial evidence to talk about how to treat that best. Turns out there may be different pathways of inflammation uh, that cause pustular psoriasis than, than the traditional psoriasis pathways do. They're, um, hopefully, I know some exciting medications that may do a better job targeting pustular disease. And second question, I've had plaque psoriasis since I was nine. I'm now 24. It's been three weeks since good Tate psoriasis started to appear. Why the change? Is it possible to have more than one type of psoriasis? No, yeah, that's a good question too. Um, so I tend to think of um, psoriasis as a, in general, if it's it's plaque types of psoriasis, it's really just a clinical spectrum. The inflammation again that drives the, the different forms of psoriasis is very similar. The exception can be gut tape psoriasis, and the exception again can be pustular psoriasis. Gut tape psoriasis. So what this what this uh, individual is asking, gut tape psoriasis is classically defined as these small, little raindrop sized plaques of psoriasis. That tend to appear very rapidly. They often favor the trunk, you know, the back, and the chest, the proximal thighs and the arms, rather than the, you know, the scalp and the and the hands and feet. It's also associated with with younger patients, again, so 24 down to teenagers with uh, psoriasis. And classically, gut tape psoriasis tends to occur after an upper respiratory. About two thirds of patients, I believe, uh, report having a you know an upper respiratory infection, and a lot of them actually had strep throat. And so gut tape lesions often are a rather acute manifestation that I think is driven often by an infection. And again, we don't have a lot of good clinical evidence to show if 
you know, the inflammation that drives gut lesions of psoriasis is different than classic psoriasis. It might be because, again, many times when you get a gut tape pattern to your psoriasis, that will actually clear pretty quickly or spontaneously over a few months as opposed to the plaque types of psoriasis. So I think, again, um, this person has had plaque type, type psoriasis for a long period of time, possibly came down with an infection or something else that triggered the gut tape eruption. And it may be that, that that will settle back down. But unfortunately, the plaque psoriasis is probably going to be. And, and again, you, you can also have fine individuals who have lots of plaque type psoriasis and at some point will get pustular disruptions. And oftentimes, again, that, that may be triggered by a different medication. There's some medications that have been uh, associated with uh, the onset of um, pustular psoriasis uh, or, you know, or some other kind of uh, inflammatory trauma. So I think, again, you certainly can have different patterns, new kind of acute pattern that may, that may resolve more easily with time and then you'll go back to your, your normal pattern. And can you have psoriasis in your mouth? And if so, what do you do for it? Wow, that's, a, that's another great one. Um, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of controversy about can you get psoriasis on the mucosal surface like the mouth. We try and find the number of reported cases of psoriasis in the mouth over you know 50, 60 years. There are very few out there. I think most most clinicians, and I would probably put myself in this category, feel that you know true psoriasis psoriasis on the mouth is probably not a real thing. Certainly, patients with psoriasis can have changes on the tongue, patches of the tongue that get denuded or raw. The, the tongue can have a, a pattern called uh, migratory glossitis. They, you know, they can get these little changing areas that are, that are sore or elevated at times. And the question is, you know, is that true psoriasis or is it just a pattern of skin change that's associated with psoriasis? Um, you don't hear of, of psoriasis, uh, you know, going and taking over your mouth and going down your esophagus into your, your gut or something. So in general, you, you don't tend to get these real thick, scaly lesions of psoriasis in the mouth. However, if, if you know if you, people do have inflammation that's you know occurring in the mouth, like I said, some of these sore areas, oftentimes that will respond to similar treatments to the to plaque psoriasis. And if I have patients complaining of soreness, I'll usually start with a topical steroid, topical corticosteroid, again, like we do for a localized psoriasis on the body. There, you know, that that's usually the most effective, safe treatment. Localized areas. Obviously, if you're you're having pain, have someone talk about a topical numbing product, a, a lidocaine, something you would do for for um, ulceration of the mouth or something like that. So, but again, in general, you're if it's manifesting in the mouth as part of your psoriasis, I'm gonna I'm gonna address it like I would a sensitive area of the body. Um, so that that usually means again, if it's localized, uh, to treat with a, a localized product, a topical product. But if that's not working, um, it's, it's an area that has obviously severe implications for one's quality of life. So moving on to a um, systemic therapy, be there, you know, an oral therapy or a, or a biologic therapy would not be inappropriate, you know, depending on other um, medical history and such of that patient. And what is a good topical for inverse psoriasis? Another good question. So inverse psoriasis tends to be, uh, you know, psoriasis that breaks out in the folds of the skin, so in the armpits. Uh, in the, the cleft of the buttocks, uh, in the folds of the groin, underneath the breasts. It tends to be more, less scaly, more bright red, can be more tender, and it can, it can fissure and be painful. And again, it's not a, in that location, it's not well studied in terms of what works best. In general, again, the, the therapies that work for psoriasis elsewhere tend to work for inverse psoriasis. Topical steroids are usually uh, rapidly effective, but there's some risk in using a potent topical steroid in an area of skin like a fold because it may thin the skin more. Oftentimes, we will use a non-steroid topical, and this could be one of the vitamin D analogs such as calcitriene. I would avoid a, a retinoid or a vitamin A derivative uh, because those can be irritating in the fold. And then the other alternatives, which are not proved to treat psoriasis, but um, many providers we use these off-label include the immune modulators, topical protopic and topical elidel. And those can be very effective in the fold and they, they haven't been associated with any of the skin or other risk factors. So I will often try one of those agents. But again, if you're having you know severe disease that's not responsive to topical therapy and you're a candidate for a systemic therapy, then that's an area that um, should respond. The question that just came in this evening, can you have plaque psoriasis on the trunk 
which would be the stomach and the back. Yes. So there's a lot of discussion about where people get psoriasis. And, and we often talk about the extensor areas of the body, like the elbows and knees and the scalp. In my opinion, those are areas more prone to trauma. Again, can turn on the psoriasis, but the trunk is really common. So, uh, so many patients have it on the back and the chest, and the abdomen, as well as the arms and legs. The good news is, um, with the exception of children, you don't often see psoriasis on the face. It does happen. And again, it's less likely on the palms and soles. But those are, those are affected. I mentioned the, the genitals are actually involved quite a bit. And, you know, as a, as a provider, I know that providers don't often ask about genital disease and patients aren't often willing to bring it up on their own. Um, we, we're, we're sort of beginning to realize that many patients have genital thrive. Unless it's discussed, we may not be treating, uh, getting treatment there. But again, genital psoriasis is obviously a, a um, big issue um, pain-wise uh, and quality of life. Um, so getting that treated is good. And since we had a large number of questions around scalp psoriasis, we have a section dedicated mm -hmm. to scalp psoriasis. So is regular use of tar shampoo advisable for scalp psoriasis? Yeah, so you know, um, one of the one of the more common things we prescribe usually is a tar-based shampoo, or on the other hand, a salicylic acid-based shampoo. What's called a keratolytic breaks apart the scale. The shampoos can certainly help. They tend to keep down the amount of scaling. Um, they can help with some of the redness and thickness. They can help with the itching. My experience is that you can often get used to one of these, and that over time, say every two to four weeks, maybe rotating your shampoos can help. So switch from a tar to a salicylic. Anti-dandruff shampoos have been shown to help psoriasis on the scalp as well. So I think a rotating schedule is pretty good. Sometimes these alone can, can get the psoriasis under fairly good control too. And I certainly, when I have patients that are also doing something else for the psoriasis of the scalp, I'll have them use these shampoos. And what is the best treatment for scalp psoriasis? Uh, another great question. Scalp, scalp psoriasis, again, is an area that's beginning to get attention. My experience, again, is that the scalp will often respond to systemic medications like the rest of the body psoriasis does. There are now uh, several good clinical trials with some of the newer biologics, um, and I, I, I don't want to forget any, but um, a Pramilast, the oral medication, the non-biologic, sorry, Epanercept or Enbrel, uh, one of the older biologics now, Ixikizumab, which is TALTS in the United States, uh, Secukinumab, which is co-centric in the U.S. Um, many of these have uh, published trials where they've looked at patients that have had bad scalp psoriasis. And again, my general sense is that most of the time, if the body is responding, the scalp's responding too, so they can work very well. When you have localized scalp psoriasis, again, strong topical corticosteroids can work well. Usually best if they're they're provided in a in a solution or a foam where you can actually apply it to the, to the scalp more easily than a cream or an ointment. There was recently approved a, a foam version of a combination product that contains vitamin D derivative as well as uh, beta methazone, a topical steroid. Um, that combination product uh, worked well for the scalp. You can do a, a form of light treatment called eczema laser therapy. Uh, which is given in a, in a, you know, in a physician's office, uh, usually twice a week. That delivers ultraviolet B right to the scalp psoriasis. It can be very effective as well. And put, has a, has a, sometimes patients go into long periods of remission with that type of treatment. Again, there's no one best treatment for any of these, including the scalp, but there are good options now, um, and there's data to help select uh, the best treatment for you. Are there any new treatments on the horizon for scalp psoriasis? Again, in turn, if you're talking about a, a dedicated scalp treatment, again, I, I've seen, seen early evidence talking about trying to treat just the itching in, in addition to the inflammation, so separate products there. We're currently involved with a clinical trial of Tildrakizumab, which is one of the biologic, uh, the brand name is Illumia in the U.S., um, and they're doing a trial dedicated to see how the scalp psoriasis responds. But again, the in general, Medications that are being approved or, or investigated for overall psoriasis, the, the pharmaceutical companies are asking questions about how the scalp is responding as well. So I don't know if we'll have dedicated treatments for just the scalp, but I think um, many new options that are on the horizon will also work for the scalp. And if someone has a small amount of persistent scalp psoriasis that's four inches square, is it worth considering a biologic? So, and that's a complex one. Obviously, 
you have to always take into consideration, um, you know, everything that's going on with you. So it needs to be a consultation with your provider and, you know, discussion of the risk and benefit. If you've been on something that's working for all the rest of your body, but you have this persistent area of the scalp that's not responding, I will usually, you know, add something to that, you know, like a topical steroid like we talked about or the laser, small amounts of psoriasis, you can actually inject steroid in there, um, for like a shot of analog, and we can do it in the office um, with a you know, small needle putting steroid right into the psoriasis, and then it can just melt away at times. If this is a small area of psoriasis, and you don't have psoriasis elsewhere, and it's not responsive to topical steroids or laser therapy, you know, usually the, the current recommendations among experts in dermatology and the NPF, the NPF own medical advisory board, is that, again, the scalp is an area where it's a special location. It causes more issues in patients, and it can be debilitating. And so if you're having debilitating disease and it's not responding to those other therapies you've tried, then sure, you're, you should consider another form of therapy, whether it's a biologic or an oral medication. The NPF has published what are called treat target guidelines, and the, the um, treat to target guidelines are a way to start having a discussion between patients and the provider about what are your goals in terms of therapy. And the, the MPF and the, the medical board have, have come up with a target of less than 1% of the skin involved with psoriasis as a treatment goal when you're starting out with more psoriasis than that. Um, and you're hoping to achieve that in three to six months. And so again, if, you're, if your disease has shrunk down, if you have four inches square, you're less than a palm of your, uh, one of your palms, correct? about 1% of your body area involved. So if you're down to four inches or so, you're you're getting to about 1% or less of the body area. And you know that would be a good goal if I had someone who had a lot of psoriasis, but it's not gonna stop me from trying to say, well, let's get that scalp better. It, you're, you're right, it's a tricky question when you get down to small amounts of psoriasis. If you're choosing medications that have good safety profiles, you know, there's an affordability question, there's a cost involved. You know, so it, it comes down to a, you know, a nuanced discussion about um, can we get this, complete, this patient completely clear? If this is the, the most troublesome spot and it, it's, it's affecting your quality of life, um, to me, that's a, it's a reason to talk about other therapy for sure. Uh, moving on to treatment options, which you have already spoken about to some degree. Is there any new combo topical treatment? When will it be available? Yeah, so I know of two, and I think they are both now on the market and approved in the U.S. at least. Again, one is this, and it's been the, the one's been around for a while, but it has a foam version, and that's the combination of the uh, the vitamin D as well as a topical steroid, betamethasone. The most novel new one, I think, is a combination of a steroid halobetazol, a strong topical steroid, and tazeratine, that vitamin A derivative, and that product is available in the U.S. as well. And both of those show good efficacy good safety. They both tend to do better when you have the combination than, than when you use either medication alone. Uh, so those are available. And what over-the-counter treatments do you recommend? Um, and, you know, healthcare in general is great. So if you're able to have a, a healthy diet, you're supplementing with a you know multi multivitamin, um, your calcium and vitamin D levels are normal. You know, those type of uh, vitamin treatments are great. Um, there's evidence that omega-3 fatty acids and fish oils or from plant-derived sources can, can improve inflammation. In terms of the skin itself, you know, the best treatments, they tend to be these uh, salicylic products or tar-based products, and they, they can be effective. My experience is, is they may not completely clear you, um, but they can, do, they can do some good for sure. Tree oil, I often recommend, especially for the scalp. Tree oil can help a lot with, with itching, for instance. People find that beneficial. Those are my common recommendations. There's not a lot of great evidence yet for what kind of dietary modifications you can do to help psoriasis other than, you know, a maintaining a healthy diet, uh, one that's uh, full of uh, carbohydrates and high glycemic uh, products. And what evidence is there to support tapering off topical steroids? Can they be used daily? Yes. So in general, uh, topical steroids have been approved uh, for daily use or twice daily use. The limitation has to do with the, the more potent topical steroids. Those can lead to um, atrophy or thinning of the skin, which makes it very fragile, and that can be irreversible. And so there's usually a two-week sustained daily use or twice daily use as a maximum period for those. 
it, it's nuanced because it can depend on where you're using it. For instance, you don't want to use them on the face you know, for much time at all because it can cause thinning rapidly. Some of the other side effects of topical therapy include you know, they can produce acne on the face um, or they can predispose you to infection. But so in general, you can use them daily. There are, you, you have to understand where you're using them and how much you're using. In little kids as well, you don't want to use large amounts of topical therapy over large parts of the body because they can actually be absorbed into the bloodstream. So in terms of tapering off topical steroid, there's not a lot of evidence showing that if you abruptly stop a steroid, you're going to have a flare of your disease. I think that's what the question is getting at. I don't, I don't tend to talk about a tapering schedule. There is a lot of evidence to show that if you're clear and doing well with a topical steroid, rather than tapering, what you can do is use what's called maintenance treatment and two days out of the week, um, say Monday and Thursday, and use the topical steroid on the old areas where your psoriasis tends to break out. And that may actually keep it away. And so it's more of a maintenance rather than a, a complete tapering off. And what physical changes occur to the areas of psoriasis plaque in the 48-hour period after phototherapy? The primary goal of phototherapy is it's inhibiting DNA synthesis. So it's, it's penetrating into the skin. It's affecting the skin cells, the keratinocytes. It's affecting the immune cells. And what it's doing is interrupting cell division. So one of the early changes, you're stopping the, the more active growth of the skin cells, which is going to help them, again, shed and regulate back to a normal thickness. But physical changes are around damaging DNA and leading to inhibition of, of um, cell division. The immune cells will, you know, over the, the course of treatment, die, and then they're no longer producing the inflammation, and they will vacate the skin. Um, so, but a lot of phototherapy is directed at this, this hyperactivity that's going on in the cells. And a permalis works well for me, but I've been taking it for four years now. How long can I or did I take it? And the answer to that is that it would be a similar answer to any medication. Um, you're going to have to talk with your provider about that. I will tell you, a Pramilast included, the longest clinical trial data that tends to exist for many uh, medications for psoriasis. You know, Pramilast included is usually five years. So. Uh, most of the big psoriasis trials involve patients staying on the medication if they do so safely, and they do to do so for up to five years, and then the trials end. So we we don't have a lot of evidence in a trial setting, which is you know which is more controlled and perhaps more scientific um, past five years. Uh, so there is, but there is evidence out there um, that talks about safety and efficacy. The, in the real world, that corona registry that, uh, that Bev mentioned uh, that's ongoing in the U.S. that tries to get more long-term evidence. So there are patients that, have, that are on medications now for over five years that are in that database. It can get us a sense of, of, of safety long term. But again, how long you stay on these, um, if you're doing well or, or not doing quite so well, uh, you have to have that discussion with your provider. Are there any consequences in going on and off biologics? No, that's a, it's another tricky question to answer. One possibility is letting your psoriasis come back with a vengeance and these having periods of, of a lot of inflammation in the skin. That may not be good for your overall health, uh, but maybe staying on something that keeps you clear is a good idea. There's some concern if you go off of a biologic, you know, once or twice or kind of multiple times uh, that your immune system can start to recognize that medication when you give it again. And if your immune system recognizes the drug, it may destroy it. So you may find the biologic doesn't seem to work as well as it used to. So that's always been a concern and still exists. Are there any new biologics coming out? Sure, there's still, uh, there are you know, several in development I know of. Um, there are probably within a year or two, you'll have uh, probably at least two more I, I, can I can think about. Oh yes, the answer is we, we have new biologics still coming out. Um, as I said, I hope uh, there's one biologic that may help pustular psoriasis. We're, we're going to do a, an exciting early trial that, that actually is a very different act in psoriasis. It involves swallowing a pill of, of bacteria. So talking about how the gut and the bacteria in your gut um, modulate the inflammation throughout the body. We're working with a company who you know, has a single bacteria that is given in large quantities, and it temporarily lives in the gut, and it actually has shown to improve inflammation throughout the body. It helps psoriasis, too. So... The answer is there's a lot of um, investigation going on. Yes, there will be several biologics that are still in the too. So, yeah. Great. This feature sounds bright. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what's the threshold to begin biologics? Do you need to have joint involvement to start a biologic sooner? 
again, you know, threshold to begin a biologic is is a it's a, it's a long, nuanced discussion because it, it's going to depend on a lot of characteristics. But again, you know, if you're failing to respond to a, a different therapy, in general, um, insurance companies in the U.S. come into play here. In general, um, when you have you know more than 10 percent of the body involved, you're considered a candidate uh, for a biologic or another systemic therapy. Or if you have these these bad disease in areas like the palms or soles or the genital sensitive areas of the scalp. Joint involvement, though, definitely increases the need to do something systemic. Um, uh, maybe not a biologic, maybe oral medication, uh, methotrexate, one of the older medications, um, a Pramalast or a Tesla, that pill is approved to treat psoriatic arthritis. And many of the biologics actually do a, a do a, a very good job, including some of the older TNF blockers. So um, joint damage and joint involvement actually pushes me to start a systemic medication for sure, uh, because the, the psoriatic arthritis can be disabling rapidly. It, it usually isn't, but it can be. And so the potential for, you know, persistent or chronic damage to your joints needs to be addressed quickly. So, and, and everybody who's going into a physician, uh, the physician should be asking about your joints. And if you're in pain, um, you need to at least have the discussion just psoriatic arthritis. Okay, and we'll take one more with the biologics due to time. Uh, can you explain the advantages of an IL-17 inhibitor versus a TNF inhibitor for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis? Too hard to answer that because um, there, there are lots of nuances here. I'll tell you, though, that TNF inhibitors and the IL-17A inhibitors in general have proven effective in psoriatic arthritis. There are actually comparative trials now where an IL-17 drug is given to half the patients and a TNF blocker is given to the other half. And in general, they're, they're showing you know, equivalent results. Some would argue there's some better results with some of the IL-17 blockers, but it's um, I think the overall statement would be that both are, are very good medications for psoriatic arthritis. And on the skin response in general, Again, it's hard to compare these, um, but there tends to be more patients that have clear or almost clear skin on the IL-17 inhibitors versus the older TNF inhibitors, um, but that's a general statement. And moving on to COVID-19. With COVID-19, I'm concerned about taking a biologic. What advice or reports do you have? Yeah, or the risk of starting about so. Uh, COVID-19 is, we're learning a lot about uh, about the coronavirus infection that leads to COVID-19. There's a general consensus, I think, emerging around the world among you know, people who are prescribing biologics um, in general, um, not stopping your biologic if you're, um, if you're healthy is, is a good idea. You always, you, you, before you stop, you, know, you always want to talk to your, your genetic provider. You know, if you actually come down with an infection, most of these biologics have a warning that says you should probably discontinue during the infection. There's also some evidence that, you know, some biologic medications may actually help if you have very bad COVID-19 or hospitalized too. So um, unfortunately, it's it's still a, it's a changing field of study. We're learning more and more about it. But I, I would say you, you should talk to your physician and say, well, what are my risks? Um, what, what should I do now? My general approach, you know, I have a lot of patients who are, who are on biologic therapy. The vast majority, we've continued that throughout the time. PF has a very good uh, discussion with different experts about uh, COVID-19 and biologic use. I encourage you to go there. NPF has a COVID-19 resource center. So this also offers a number of different resources where you can access the medical board's recommendations. There are different podcast episodes. You have guidelines on how to be involved with your telemedicine health visits. So I encourage everyone to check COVID resource center and research. So what are some of the pioneering research trends regarding treatment of psoriasis? There are new avenues of investigation, again, talking about how the uh, biome, the microbes that live on our skin and their gut, uh, how maybe they can be used to, to influence uh, things like psoriasis. There's a question, I think, about a, using a patch instead of an injection for biologic. Uh, there, are, there are lots of studies going on about how to deliver medications differently, um, whether it's with a patch. A biologic, unfortunately, probably can't be delivered with a patch because it's a big protein molecule and it can't get across the barrier of the skin with just a patch. And there are needleless devices um, that are available or being researched. So uh, using um, water jet, really tiny focus stream of water or, or um, gas of some sort like carbon dioxide so that you can give a biologic injection without uh, using a needle. Those are, those are being investigated. There's you know, genetic research on um, who's predisposed to psoriasis. There's a lot of discussion about um, can we find a test? I think there's a question here about uh, psoriatic arthritis detection and 
So are there blood tests or genetic tests or things that can diagnose psoriatic arthritis? A lot of, uh, there's a lot of research ongoing about finding out who would be the best candidate for a given medication. So, um, you know, say I have a patient that I want to put on a biologic, how do I pick the right biologic? Well, maybe we can, we can actually figure that out based on a, you know, a, a profile of their, their immune system or something too. So, most of the trends uh, that are exciting tend to focus on what's called personalized medicine, you know, ways to sort of uh, tailor treatment so there's less guesswork involved in who's going to respond to what and how they'll, how they'll do. So there's one also question about, is there any progress in discovering the cause of psoriasis in the beginning of a cure? Yeah, the, the answer is that it's this genetic predisposition and it's a, it's a complex genetic thing. So I don't, I don't think we're going to find a single gene correct with gene therapy or something. That would be exciting, but we, we, you know, there's a lot of understanding, I think, of what drives psoriasis now, and that certainly has led, you know, again, to, to many of the, the medications that are available and are certainly changing lives. We'll take a question that's uh, from online. Someone's wondering, how long can you stay on a biologic? In other words, if they've been on it for years, can they continue to be on it as long as it is effective? It's another great question, and the, I, I will tell you, again, it's, it's, there's no right or wrong answer to that. I will tell you there are many patients who have been on a biologic medication, you know, for decades now, and for various different illnesses, rheumatoid arthritis being one that was treated way back, some of the TNF blockers we use for psoriasis too. So there are many patients who are planning to stay on these for their, their entire lives. And again, it's, you know, it's, it's looking at, are there cumulative risks over time? So um, that's where, where uh, registry, uh, registries like the Corona database can help because if we follow enough patients, we'll see if, you know, if you stay on X biologic for 10 years, 20 years, does it raise your risk of, you know, having other illness or having side effects? And again, in general, um, the, the safety that's seen early on uh, um, has looked good with many newer agents. So it's certainly, I certainly have plenty of patients who have, have been on these for, for a decade or so now. Great. Well, we're out of time. So thank you, Dr. East, for answering all of these questions. We certainly had quite a few, and we appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate everybody for listening. Hope, hope I was able to, to provide a little bit of insight. Absolutely, you did. August is Psoriasis Action Month. You can take action by reaching out to our Patient Navigation Center for a free appointment prep kit. Participate in So Virtual Active Day in your own way, which is this Saturday, August 22nd. Ride a stationary bike, jump rope, swim laps, shoot hoops in your driveway. Just do it your way, however you would like. You can learn more at the URL listed on the screen. Help support research towards a cure. In 2020, the NPF gave $3.28 million towards research funding. You can do your part by participating in So Protect Me, an international registry looking at the impact of COVID-19, whether you have the disease or not. Take 10 minutes or less to participate, and you can do so online at SoProtectMe.org. In addition to today's webinar, podcasts are also available through Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, or feed service of your choice. You can access podcasts at the website listed here. Upcoming podcasts address the Soap Protect Me registry, which I just mentioned, tips for making telehealth visits more successful, and released earlier today, a podcast about the relationship between lung health, inflammation, and psoriasis with pulmonologist Dr. Albert Rizzo. You can contact the Patient Navigation Center if you still have questions, would like additional information about treatment options, finding a physician, or having issues with accessing treatments. Contact our Navigation Center by phone, email, live chat, or Skype, and be sure to take advantage of the chance to receive a free appointment prep kit, which includes tips on how to talk with your provider, information about treatment types and options, recommendations for telehealth visits, and a checklist of what to bring to your appointment. Once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey to provide feedback about the presentation. Tell us what you think, we value and appreciate your comments. I'd like to thank our sponsors again for their support of today's webinar, which is greatly appreciated. Abney, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Janssen, Novartis, CeraVe, and Neutrogena. And finally, you can access our webcast archive under the new page, which is psoriasis.org, watch hyphen and hyphen listen. This concludes our presentation today. Thank you for attending.